Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are on uh, First Medical Channel and we have a very interesting um, uh, guest here. It's uh, Dr. Tankred Stobe. Dr. Tankred Stobe is um, uh, emergency and intensive care uh, unit doctor. And uh, as well, he has a great experience with uh, MSF, Medical Science Frontiers Organizations. He participated in a huge number of missions in uh, different countries of the world. Um, uh, he also was a president of uh, German MSF organization and uh, for the moment he works as a consultant for emergency medicine and intensive care for MSF. Hello Dr. Stebe. Hello, nice uh, to meet you. For the moment, my very first uh, question to you. What uh, do you think about MSF? Mo what most important words uh, you could uh, tell about that, maybe three words, mm -hmm. what is it? MSF today is a, is a global medical humanitarian organization uh, following the principles of neutrality, impartiality and independence. And we work in more than 70 countries. Um, our goal is to reach those patients who are in greatest needs because of a natural disaster mm -hmm. or a man-made disaster. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great challenge and a great pleasure to deal with uh, those challenges. It's always frustrating, mm -hmm. but it's also extremely um, rewarding to work uh, in, in, in missions with MSF. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just back from Venezuela, where it was really interesting to see how we can um, help improving the healthcare in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've been to interesting places and uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great work. Uh, we will we'll talk about it, uh, certainly about your missions and um, uh, b b b I really want to know about uh, your mission uh, um, uh, to Africa regarding uh, Ebola epidemic and Venezuela as well. But uh, for me, generally, when I uh, had a uh, word MSF, uh, the first uh, very important word is romantic. Is it romantic uh, to work with uh, MSF? Romantic? challenge and maybe a little bit danger. Of course, a human passion as well, etc. Yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. Actually, my first mission was pretty romantic. It started pretty romantic because it was uh, in the jungle of Myanmar mm -hmm. back in 2002. Um, and it was a cross-border mission. So we were living in Thailand and every day we crossed into Myanmar and we were uh, serving a small population in the jungle mm -hmm. uh, who were living in 10 uh, mm -hmm. little camps. Um, so the first view was a romantic uh, uh, forest, a jungle, a tropical forest. Um, looking deeper into this, and of course that's what we did, looking at the health mm -hmm. issues of these people, um, uh, it was less romantic. Um, there was fighting almost mm -hmm. every day, so it was a, a kind of a civil war situation and the people couldn't do really normal life. Uh, the, there were mines everywhere, there was shooting, so mm -hmm. people, uh, yeah, uh, so it, it, it looked romantic, but the deeper you look into it, uh, the less romantic it became. And of course, the work we do um, is uh, quite often very serious. Um, um, but of course, uh, there is sometimes the discrepancy between the beauty of the nature mm -hmm. and the, the terrible circumstances where people have to survive. And actually, it, it uh, brought us to my second question. You are a normal German doctor. So you are an educated German doctor. You have license uh, to practice in German. You possibly um, uh, should have a good salary, good position, uh, normal life of German doctor. What um, uh, made uh, you to join MSF? Uh, why you made such kind of decision? Uh, um, uh, what um, uh, sort of your family about this decision? Can you just uh, uh, yeah. brought some clarity to, to, to the point? What, 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 what uh, uh, brought a normal uh, yeah. Western doctors uh, to MSF and nurses, of course? Yeah, and, and indeed, this is not an, uh, it's, it's quite an extraordinary decision, which for me didn't feel like this. Yeah? So when I finished my medical school, um, in Germany and I, I worked at practice as a doctor and I did in intensive mm -hmm. care medicine, I did emergency medicine um, for some time and then I came to the point in my life that I felt like is this is all? Yeah, do you want to continue doing your career in Germany? Um, and I, I realized that um, my decision to go into medicine in the first place, to study medicine, was to also help people who are less fortunate than um, what we have in our mm -hmm, civilized mm -hmm, societies. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so even as a medical student, I went uh, to Africa for some elective terms. Mm -hmm. um, and then I sort of remembered back these motives, why, why I became a doctor. Um, and that brought me to the point to say, yeah, now you're qualified. Now you can give something back. Um, and then I said, yeah, you're, you're young. Yeah, this is uh, back in 2002. Um, let's go. And then I applied for MSF. Uh, they, they accepted me. And then so it was uh, completely your decision. I meant uh, you didn't have uh, somebody who influenced uh, your decision, some colleague who already worked for MSF. So no. you I didn't even know MSF very well at the time. And back then it was quite a, it was quite a tough decision because mm -hmm. I had to leave everything behind in Germany. So I, I quit my job, which was I had an undefinite contract mm -hmm. in the hospital. Uh, I, I, I cancelled my, my apartment. I um, put my car on standby, so mm -hmm. all insurances I, I quit. Yeah, so I really had to sort of say goodbye to my previous life um, mm -hmm. and make myself available. Um, and then I said to MSF, okay, October 2002, you can, I'm, I'm free. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky because they found a mission right then. Um, and that took me, uh, that, that brought me into the jungle of Myanmar for 10 months. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I was, and that was quite a change because uh, being intensive care doctor, which is quite a sterile mm -hmm. environment every day, and then being uh, responsible as the only doctor for 10,000 people in the mm -hmm. jungle, that was probably the biggest change I could imagine to do. Um, but it was really interesting and challenging and rewarding. Uh, I never regretted mm -hmm. a single moment uh, that I did that decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and since then, I never could... I, I knew I have to do this again, yeah, so I could never let go because the, the kind of experience I do in a, um, in a crisis area is, is really intense and the, the need for doctors and nurses is of course much higher than it is in Germany. Um, in, 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 those, in those crisis areas, um, my responsibility as a doctor is so much higher uh, because there is no backup mm -hmm. system. Yeah? There's, there's maybe one doctor, one nurse uh, who care for thousands of people. Um, so uh, yeah, we we You're really only feel one. You're only one. Yeah, and you know that you you can't, you shouldn't fail. Yeah, I mm -hmm. mean you should never fail as a doctor, mm -hmm. but there is no backup system. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so that makes you uh, much working, much more alert, much more concentrated. Uh, you you get the best out of your your skills um, because they are needed. So and um, um, actually it bring uh, it bring me another question which uh, uh, I was going to ask uh, later. Uh, who um, uh, what medical professionals could uh, join to MSF? Uh, uh, do they have any special requirements regarding uh, education, uh, licensing in um, uh, any particular countries? How um, this you know? hiring or uh, just uh, choosing the proper doctors and nurses because obviously you need uh, some kind of uh, special uh, possibilities even you know mm -hmm. uh, your, your health should be good if you are going to spend uh, 10 months in the jungles how uh, MSF is making uh, finding the mm -hmm. stuff uh, mm -hmm. let's say so what is a requirement and uh, if you don't mind uh, just mention uh, is it possible for Russian doctor or nurse uh, to join uh, MSF and uh, what they should, uh, they should do? Any examinations or yeah. anything else? Yeah, we're we constantly uh, looking for uh, qualified and motivated doctors, nurses, logisticians um, to join MSF. Mm -hmm. um, there are some essential criteria to join. One is you need to be, um, uh, talking about doctors, um, you need to have your license all done. Yeah, so you plus two years of practical experience. But mm -hmm. this could be internal medicine, emergency medicine, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. But two years of practical experience, um, you need to speak English because that's mm -hmm. the international language uh, we use. Uh, um, sorry, did you check uh, the level of English in your IELTS or something no, like this? Or it's just... Uh, in, a, in a conversation, part mm -hmm. of the introduction interview will be in English. Mm -hmm. yeah, so just to verify uh, that you have a good a basic command in, in writing mm -hmm. and, 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 and talking. Um, you, you, you should be willing to work in countries which are 
probably less uh, uh, luxury mm -hmm. uh, luxurious than than where you come from. Um, you need to be a good team player yeah, because everything we do is a teamwork and you very how, much rely to each other. How did you check it that it's good uh, team player or not? Because uh, obviously uh, on mission it's uh, very clear <laughs> within very first two or three days. Mm -hmm. But uh, before that you, you probably need to know that uh, this person is good team player. Yeah. And you can apply, I mean, you just go online and check the Russian website. Mm -hmm. That would be the easiest. Yeah, you put in MSF uh, Russia. Um, and there you find all the criteria to work. And what happens then is you have an extensive interview. And in that interview, uh, it's not only for MSF to, to look at the candidate yeah, who wants to join MSF. It's also for the candidate to get to know the organization to mm -hmm. realize if that's the right uh, way to go. Um, and there we, we look at uh, what's the motivation of, of the person, um, what's the English uh, skills, what, is, is that a possible team player? Mm -hmm. Of course, you're never sure, but um, our, our uh, human resource people are quite good in, in detecting the best people uh, to, um, to hire then. And what's then necessary is that once you are qualified, once the, that interview is successful, um, you have to sort of make sure or you have to tell us when you are available. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and then we will look uh, globally in, in, in the whole network of, of Doctors Without Borders where the profile you bring in fits best to one of those um, uh, projects. Mm -hmm. And then we send you a, a project offer, mm -hmm. uh, which you then, if you like it, you agree. And then we send you there and you... You, we hope you have a good mission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, actually, I'm also interested about uh, the level of medical education because it's uh, uh, very clear that in the world medical education is uh, quite different. Uh, for the moment, for example, in Russia, we have uh, a lot of discussion about uh, discussions about quality of medical mm -hmm. education. So I meant um, uh, uh, taking a doctor from um, uh, any other country without, uh, let's say, so very standard medical mm -hmm. education. You 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 risk that. Uh, this doctor or nurse could be a little bit uneducated mm -hmm. and need you know some improvement of uh, medical knowledge skill mm -hmm. how it's uh, checked and uh, mm -hmm. done uh, mm -hmm. in MSF I mean we we in all the world where we work here yeah, and where we have offices of course we know the national protocol of for example of the nursing schools or the medical universities yeah so we know pretty much the level of standard and quality uh, they bring in. Um, and that's everywhere in the world. And if we find that this is not sufficient to join MSF, yeah, we would maybe also send this person to a special training. Mm -hmm. um, but we, of course, have to make sure that um, uh, everyone who joins MSF has good skills, has good quality um, measurements, mm -hmm. um, because that's our goal. Yeah, We, mm -hmm. we want yeah. to bring in the best medical quality everywhere in the world. Um, and for, for example, for surgeons and anesthetists, if they want to join MSF, they need to specialize before. Mm -hmm. yeah, otherwise, it's only two years of experience we mm -hmm. demand. But for surgeons and anesthetists, um, they need to be uh, done with mm -hmm. their specialization um, because they should operate from mm -hmm. day one until the end. They could also join for a shorter time, for a couple of weeks, um, because for them, we only want them to work in an uh, operational theater. Is it uh, dangerous uh, to be um, uh, an MSF doctor or not? Of course, uh, sort of more than half of all the projects we are running at the moment are in crisis areas. Um, so clearly there is an ex a higher exposure to, um, to security issues than um, maybe from the countries we come from. Um, at the same time, the safety and security of our staff is the number one priority of the organization to look after. And of course, there is a discrepancy there yeah, because mm -hmm. we cannot claim that working in Somalia and Libya and Yemen is, mm -hmm. is, is very safe. Um, the good news is that um, yeah, it's, it's a rare exception, exception that something happened uh, in terms of kidnapping, uh, injuries, threats uh, in the field. So um, because we look very much after mm -hmm. that issue and if we feel that it's not safe in a certain area to work anymore, we would evacuate from mm -hmm. that area. Um, and um, me, after 20 missions with, with, with the organization, I had maybe a handful of uh, situations um, where it was dangerous, but I, I was lucky also mm -hmm. to get, get out of mm -hmm. that uh, quite, quite good. Harm both physically and mentally. Yeah. Um, also the mental health component we take very seriously. So whenever someone feels not comfortable, um, uh, this employee has always the right to go home 
from a mission uh, and say, well, I don't feel safe here anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but also there are psychologists mm -hmm. uh, always at hand uh, to help out if someone feels stressed. Or even uh, on the mission you have a psychologist. Yeah. There's a briefing before, there's a briefing after, but also during the mission time. They can always call. There's always a number of a psychologists mm -hmm. to call. Do you have any special training for MSF staff, uh, like some kind of survival? I know there is a, a survival training for journalists who are working in some hot spots, etc. Do you have a special training for MSF staff uh, in case uh, they are taking hot hostages, uh, in case uh, they had some shooting uh, or? Uh, obviously, some medical training they have in case of epidemics, etc. Yeah. So everyone, every employee who joins the organization, there's usually uh, introduction days where, where there's a general training for what comes uh, for them in the mission. Then there's a briefing usually in the capital of the country they leave from. Mm -hmm. And then there are several briefings along the way. And then it very much depends on the country. Usually for someone who goes on a first project with MSF, we don't send them in a hot conflict. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, that's usually we do with, with more uh, experienced um, uh, people. Um, but in every crisis so area... So you are the man. <laughs> well, that's why they sent me uh, almost everywhere. But um, even in, a, in, a, in every country, we have specific security um, setups, which mm -hmm. are quite uh, uh, tough sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, where we decide when there's a curfew, when we, how far we can reach. Sometimes I have been in Somalia, uh, where our only range of movement was, was not outside the clinic, because uh, it was so dangerous. So we, it was just within the, the house, it was up and down. Yeah? So mm -hmm. in the ground floor, we had the emergency room. Mm -hmm and we lived on the top floor, yeah, so all our movements were, mm -hmm. were within the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you have to up to three, four security briefings a day to update about the changing uh, situation. But no formal course. Uh well, no, 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 it's really a course. We are just uh, moving like this. Uh, we are putting the cask or something like no. this. No, mm -hmm. the situation is very different in every country. Yeah? So we always adopt the security briefing to the situation. Um, and of course, there are also projects which are quite safe where, where um, it's not dangerous. And we have to keep in mind, most dangerously, almost in every country, are roadside accidents mm -hmm. yeah, because yeah. Uh, the the traffic, but also the condition of the cars um, in most of the countries we work is not the same as as we maybe know it mm -hmm. here in Russia. Mm -hmm. um. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, very recently, I think uh, five years ago, maybe maybe ten years ago, it was um, uh, uh, absolutely necessary. It started to be absolutely necessary in Russia to wear a seat belt. So um, for the moment, we can say so. I presume uh, I, I'm pretty sure MSF uh, has a policy regarding seat belt yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for the staff, and every uh, MSF car has, you know, if yeah. you MSF uh, staff put a seat belt, etc. Some, some drivers refuse to start even the engine. Yeah. If you don't wear your seat belt, yeah, so they yeah. become very strict Yeah, 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 that. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Met with such kind of situation. Uh, did you ever uh, wear a gun uh, proofed, uh, uh, bulletproof uh, mm -hmm. waist and cask on uh, MSF mission? There's a reason for this, yeah, because uh, one of our policies is that every hospital we work in has to be weapon free. Mm -hmm. yeah? So before we start collaborating with a hospital, we make sure that um, there is no weapons mm -hmm. in the hospital. Um, and that's not only because of our staff to be safe, yeah, but we say um, it is necessary also for our patients to be safe. And mm -hmm. I've, I've worked in, um, in Libya, for example, mm -hmm. where it took quite some time for us to convince all the staff and the security staff mm -hmm. of that hospital to get all the weapons out. Um, the best argument I had for the security man in that was because there were stray bullets in the hospital injuring mm -hmm. and killing patients. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I told him, you see it with your own eyes. Yeah, this is not acceptable. Yeah? So this is a strong policy. Um, and if we see um, uh, that there are sort of bullets going around, yeah, we, we go hiding. We mm -hmm. can't work there because mm -hmm. we cannot risk the life of our staff. Um, but of course, um, in, in, a, in a hot conflict, uh, this, this is a potential thing. But we. Uh, we don't go into the direct fighting area. Yeah? We, we then go back until mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it's safe enough to work there.
Okay. And uh, what about um, insurance for MSF staff? Do you have a good insurance? Are you satisfied with insurance uh, for MSF? Because obviously, uh, families and uh, um, uh, the staff should, uh, should, should know they are protected. Yeah. So everyone who joins MSF um, <coughs> gets a salary. It's mm -hmm. not a big salary. Evacuation policy, there's a, uh, uh, also sort of everyone gets a, mm -hmm. a proper working contract. Um, and we, uh, we are a fair employee, we have covered everything. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, we are a, a humanitarian organization. Yeah? This is not comparable with, with sort of the biggest luxury uh, companies around there. Uh, we, we do it decently, we do it, I think, fair. Um, so no one needs mm -hmm. to uh, fear about um, uh, survival in, during a mission. Um, uh, did you make any serious mistakes, medical or organizational, when you've been uh, on the missions? And uh, if yes, or if you feel that it was a mistake, maybe you could uh, just uh, t tell me about that. Because it's obvious, people mm. uh, making mistakes and sometimes they could be quite serious. But yeah. uh, it's uh, certainly interesting. I certainly, when I did my first mission and, and I came from sort of a German uh, uh, hospital work, mm -hmm. working in intensive care unit and then being in the jungle of Myanmar, um, it was a complete change. Oh, yeah, Everything that I learned about heart attack and, 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 and diabetes, I never found in the jungle mm -hmm. and everything I saw there was malaria, dengue fever, some strange uh, uh, yeah, casualties. Um, Just strange, yeah. <laughs> I've strange ne never diseases, seen before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what really helped me in order to not making too many mistakes was um, to listen to my colleagues, yeah, to see, to hear what they advised me to do because they had a huge experience. Um, and then learn quickly um, because, of course, uh, for the first days and weeks uh, they accepted me to learn, but then, of course, they also expect, expected me to be head of everything and to be a really uh, help from them. So, yeah, so. Uh, again, a teamwork. A teamwork, always work together with our national colleagues and it's, it's probably the best advice I can give in a first um, project uh, to, to open your eyes, to open your ears, mm -hmm. but to shut your mouth for a while and to listen and to learn uh, on the spot. That's the best way to prevent mistakes. Now let's um, now start to talk a little bit uh, about your most interesting missions. Let's um, uh, speak about uh, a, a little about um, Ebola mission. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually was uh, quite a real participator and the doctor there. And I know that you even criticized, uh, criticized um, uh, World Health Organization for their approach to uh, epidemic. Maybe you could uh, just tell uh, some of your impression and most important um, uh, conclusions you made mm -hmm. uh, after the epidemics. Maybe you will be able to show some pictures mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I'm pretty certain will be interesting, mm -hmm. interesting for our auditory. Yeah, I think the Ebola epidemic in uh, West Africa 2014-2016 um, was a really game changer for mm -hmm. the organization because we had never had a deadly um, epidemic like Ebola before. Um, when it started, we had about 40 experts for Ebola, which is quite a, quite a mm -hmm. high number of experts mm -hmm. for a disease which until then was always just in a regional context for a short time. Uh, of course, people also died. The the lethal rate. I presume you took uh, everybody from the world. To, to be honest, with this 400. 40, 40. Four, uh, we 40, had 40. 40. Yeah, <laughs> but the thing is, in Ebola, what we usually do, we we ask them to work there for mm -hmm. four weeks, and then we have to take them out, uh, so they can relax again and 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 sort of uh, yeah, uh, find some time to re rejuvenate. Right? Um, and those 40 experts were very quickly used mm -hmm. off in, in Ebola um, and what we had to do, we had to train hundreds of people. Um, never before in the history of, mm -hmm. of, of MSF we trained so many people, not only for our own clinics but also for other uh, organizations uh, because uh, for many months MSF we were the only major medical player in mm -hmm. West Africa to help. You, you meant uh, medical people? Medical people. How to wear the protective gear, mm -hmm. how to handle those very sick patients. Another dimension was that um, we never had so many patients our under care dying. Normally mm -hmm. when we make it possible to reach the patient wherever in the world or the patient reaches us, they're not dying anymore. Yeah? We, we can help them surviving. In Ebola, 
still the majority of people who came to our clinic passed away. In uh, these two, three years, uh, more than 3,000 patients died in our clinics, which, which was never before. Yeah, so Could I ask um, uh, a short question um, uh, uh, as an emergency and intensive care doctor? Um, um, uh, did they die without mechanical ventilation? Because obviously you um, uh, didn't have uh, so many mm -hmm. ventilators in the place. So mm -hmm. it was uh, just... Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't uh, uh, find a proper word. It was some kind of normal disease done without mm -hmm. mechanical ventilation and b b without intensive care support. Yeah. Oh, I'm wrong. In the beginning, that was true. Uh, and it was um, always, we didn't know, is this curative medicine or is it palliative mm -hmm. medicine? It was actually both. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we, for every patient, we did not know whether or not this patient will survive or not. And um, uh, maybe to sort of show some pictures, this is uh, the treatment center I was working in in Sierra Leone in, uh, in um, January 2015. It was set up for, for 100 people um, in the outskirts of uh, Freetown, the, the capital of Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we could admit up to 100 patients, Ebola patients there. Um, and we had three tents and I was responsible for the emergency tent. And I switch um, now for... Maybe for you have um, uh, just a picture inside the emergency yeah, room. That will yeah, be interesting. I'll, I'll switch. How we had to gear up yeah, in, the, in the left upper side, you see we had the normal um, um, <clears throat> clothes with us and then we had uh, to cover up and, and there was always someone watching us, making sure that not a square centimeter mm -hmm. of skin is unprotected. And then on the big picture, you see um, we are fully geared and then we had... Uh, on our uh, upper arm, they wrote the, the time, yeah, and mm -hmm. then we had exactly one hour in the intensive care uh, area to work, yeah, because after one hour, your concentration gets weak, you get tired, mm -hmm. and that was the moment when we had to get out. Um, so, so it was, um, um, uh, this decision was made uh, from your um, uh, primary experience, uh, right. um, uh, was this one hour limitation. Because you In this gear, you are sweating. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like walking it's mm -hmm. like it's like working in a sauna yeah? mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know in Russia right y but in a so, so sauna, sauna usually know, yeah. you, you, you sit down and you relax you maybe talk yeah but you don't walk work yeah mm -hmm. and imagine you work very hard in a sauna and that's what that was in these very recently I don't know if uh, it will be cut it or not but maybe you've uh, seen the movie Americans uh, made the movie regarding Chernobyl uh -huh, no. And it's named Chernobyl. It, mm -hmm. It's actually great, in uh -huh. my view. Uh -huh. it, it's really great. And the people there just walked the, in um, reactor, yeah. in uh -huh. such kind of uh, yeah, you know, stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, gear. And it was mm -hmm. uh, very, um, a very good uh, picture how they exhausted, etc., yeah. etc. Yeah. Uh, if you have time, I, I, it's in English. Okay. Uh, okay. Just see it. it. It's really interesting. Okay. And maybe it's uh, just ma make you know, some remind of your yeah. mission because it's, it's, it's for serious, but it's, yeah. uh, it was a huge success mm -hmm. uh, all, over the, all over the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it just... Yeah. Well, here in this protective gear, um, just to go back, here within one hour we lost about two liters of sweat. Yeah? Um, so after we, we came out, we had to drink at least two liters to replace the fluids we lost. And then uh, the innovative thing here was that this is the intensive care tent and what we... Um, improved here was to have this plexiglass corridor mm -hmm. which allowed us to go without protection into that corridor mm -hmm. and watch the patients 24 hours a mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. and so we could see if they pull out their IV lines, if they fell off their beds, if they needed mm -hmm. help, if they had pain, which was a very simple thing to do but it was only in the end of that um, uh, epidemic that we had those innovations which which uh, were really helpful for us to do a better treatment mm -hmm. uh, for these patients. I need to ask you about this uh, face mask. Uh, mm -hmm. I already asked you mm -hmm. actually but uh, since we are a medical channel uh, a lot of people could say that Ebola doesn't have an air transmission etc mm -hmm. etc. What mm -hmm. is the point for face mask mm -hmm. and uh, uh, such kind of stuff if you could yeah. make a short answer. Yeah. Well, the, the transmission is uh, really, you need to have mm -hmm. direct contact. It's usually the sweat, yeah. So mm -hmm. a lot of transmission in West Africa happened by the funeral procedures, yeah. Mm -hmm. So relatives washing the dead body. Mm -hmm. um, of course, every sort of body fluids can transmit it. Um, 
But uh, of course, people were moving around, yeah, and you never knew whether they're going to touch you or you touch mm -hmm. yourself yeah, with viruses on mm -hmm. your on your gloves. That's why it was so important to cover well. Actually, the redressing procedure yeah, to get off the mask and all those di different layers was even more important because then mm -hmm. we had uh, Ebola uh, mm -hmm. viruses all over mm -hmm. us. Yeah, so the dressing moment was important, but to undress was more. And they someone watched us, and we were sprayed with chlorine with every. Uh, layer we, we mm -hmm. put off uh, from this um, and I show you um, this how long by the way it took to, um, uh, to dress it up and uh, to dress it uh, off this was I would say probably each each of those maneuvers about 10 minutes uh, uh -huh. at least yeah. Yeah. because it also when we undressed there uh, we had to be very careful that um, uh, we every every layer we took off were properly disposed uh, and then uh, sprayed again yeah, because um, we didn't want that the virus comes to the skin um, uh, and that that was uh, uh, at the end of that yeah, you were sweating a lot you you worked very hard but you knew the most important moment to be concentrated was the undressing moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, how it was possible actually uh, to rush uh, in the world uh, for RSI, I mean, uh, rapid sequence intubation, something mm -hmm. like this? Uh, if you are undressed, you can't go, obviously. Mm -hmm. So somebody should be dressed uh, all the time and uh, be there in case uh, the patient is uh, suddenly deteriorated. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, this is what the, this plexiglass corridor mm -hmm. helped us, yeah, because this was our monitoring. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds very, very sort of. Uh, uh, basic, yeah, and and um, uh, but it was very good because we could observe the patients in this matter, um, and the 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 things we could do is of course we could give them uh, fluid treatment was very important mm -hmm. yeah, because they all were vomiting, having diarrhea, mm -hmm. sweating, mm -hmm. having so, so fever, uh, lost fluid, obviously. Yeah, but they didn't drink because mm -hmm. they were so tired and weak they couldn't drink. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we knew they're losing a lot of fluids uh, but we also knew they're not taking any fluids and yeah? so the fluid replacement was one of the big challenges we had pain management of uh, course iv or uh, any uh, ng tube uh? well we we started iv but then in in the later process of the disease sometimes um, all all sort of hands legs mm -hmm. were were swollen yeah so sometimes we also had to do bone injections mm -hmm. we sometimes even gave it through the um, abdominal skin um, so we used all means, of course, when they were still in the early phase of Ebola, they could still drink and swallow. Yeah? But that well, 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 uh, I'm sorry, just a medical question. Mm -hmm. uh, why na not a nasal uh, gastric tube uh, mm -hmm. just to give a fluid? Well, the thing is, once they, uh, you put it there, mm -hmm. there is a higher risk of, um, of vomiting and, mm -hmm. and, 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 of course, aspiration. Um, and usually what, what comes in the later stage of Ebola, um, people were so weak and also confused and they pulled out mm -hmm. almost everything they had. So whenever we inserted something mm -hmm. and they felt uncomfortable, they would pull it out. Mm -hmm. yeah? So um, when we put an IV line in, we also had to make sure to go do good bandages mm -hmm. yeah, so it mm -hmm. stays in yeah, because they mm -hmm. were sweating as well. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good fixation. So we had to deal with a lot of different challenges mm -hmm. there medically. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, plus, they would get confused, yeah, and they didn't respond or didn't cooperate the way uh, we mm -hmm. would like them to do. Um, and we never knew this was the big challenge whether they will survive or not. Uh, even we had patients who were, became very sick, and I, I thought I wasn't sure whether they're going to survive, and they mm -hmm. did survive. Um, I, I maybe should tell you mm -hmm. the story mm -hmm. of um, yeah, yeah, sure. This um, <coughs> we see this little girl here. This her name yeah. is Mariatu. Uh, she was six years old and she was admitted together with her mother. She's not on the picture. And when she was admitted, uh, Mariatu already was very sick. Yeah? She mm -hmm. was uh, weak mm -hmm. and fever, but the mother sounded um, healthy. Um, mm -hmm. But we knew yeah, by the time if one of them is infected with Ebola, the other one is as well because they were so close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? <clears throat> and um, the, the symptoms of Ebola in the beginning are very general. Yeah? They have fever, they mm -hmm. have sometimes vomiting, they have body pain. It's flu-like. Uh, flu-like symptoms. Sometimes it could be confused with malaria. Yeah? So, um, so we admitted both because they fulfilled the criteria mm -hmm. of our checklist. Yeah? So we admitted them and did the blood testing. Unfortunately, both turned out to be Ebola positive and then um, the mother also became sicker. Trouble of the mother was she was also pregnant six months. And um, for a long time, it was clear that every 
woman who is pregnant um, has almost no chance of survival with mm -hmm. Ebola. Um, so we had despite... Uh, you meant uh, women um, uh, don't have uh, chances for survival with Ebola or... Pregnant fetus? woman. Pregnant, pregnant woman, woman uh, mm. uh, didn't have a chance to right. survive with uh, Ebola. Yeah. No, no, it's not about fetus. Not, not, not the, not the uh, gender, mm -hmm. it was the pregnant mm -hmm. women. <clears throat> so despite everything we tried with, with the mother of Mariato, she passed away, which of course was terrible. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the focus was on Mariato, whether mm -hmm. or not she would survive. And, and I was very glad that she finally would do it. And then um, we were happy to uh, see her go. Uh, we have a picture here where uh, oh, she, nice. she stressed, uh, she stressed um, in a new dress yeah. Yeah, because we had to burn all her old clothes yeah, because they were, mm -hmm. were infected with Ebola. And we were uh, standing there all clapping because we were yeah. so happy that she was finally uh, surviving. And she was lucky mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, she wasn't lucky because she lost her yeah, mother. Yeah, sure, sure. She also lost her father because he died before from Ebola. But she had an uncle and mm -hmm. um, her grandfather mm -hmm. who were willing to take her back. Mm -hmm. And many, many Ebola patients were not be accepted again in their family or community because they felt, even though it wasn't true, they felt they could be still infectious, yeah, so they, they refused to take them back, which, which was terrible. So it, uh, it's some kind of uh, mark. Right, a stigma. Yes, yeah, stigma. Uh, and what we see um, on, on this picture, the, the, the woman next to Mariato in the blue uh, gown, uh, she is a survivor of Ebola. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what happened to those um, survivors if they were not accepted back in their family or in their village, some of them came back to us and said, can, can we work mm -hmm. for you? And, f and that was almost a win-win situation because for them, they could, we could offer they them a job. They have immunity. They have immunity. We, they didn't have to have the full protection mm -hmm. here because they couldn't be mm -hmm. infected by Ebola again. And they could help a lot. Yeah? So she could feed uh, Mariato. She could play with Mariato. Yeah? This was mm -hmm. a really uh, mm -hmm. a great thing. And they were happy because they were needed yeah? and they didn't feel excluded after mm -hmm. they survived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's really interesting, mm -hmm. Re really interesting. And actually, Mom, uh, uh, what I wanted to tell, it's uh, even not a question, it's maybe, you know, some kind of conversation. Generally, um, every mission in disaster or every mission in um, uh, some kind of uh, serious uh, uh, situation with multiple injuries, it's not about any high-tech medicine, no. let's say so. It's a uh, very basic, very, mm. very difficult organizational problems, very diff difficult uh, logistics, but uh, e e it's a basic medicine. Medicine, so it's not a very scientific thing, mm -hmm. but I feel that uh, during this Ebola um, uh, uh, epidemics you made a lot of scientific work uh, mm -hmm. as well because uh, obviously you've been a, a first uh, medical persons who, who who've been uh, mm -hmm. so close to the disease and uh, to the patient, etc., etc. Am I right about yeah. this? And we, we, it was clear when when the epidemic started in West Africa. We had no vaccination against Ebola and we had no treatment mm -hmm. and there was no medicine. And it was very typical for, for neglected tropical diseases that there is no research. Mm -hmm. yeah? The big pharma companies are not interested to invest Obviously, yeah. in, in, in diseases which are only happening to the poor. So let's, yeah. be, let's be clear on that. So we pushed a lot yeah, um, in the scientific world to say now is the moment we need a vaccination, we need drugs. And so the good news out of that epidemic is that um, a vaccine was developed, which is now, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not yet fully approved, but we, we have tested it now in uh, Eastern Congo, which mm -hmm. is a very terrible situation because we have a new Ebola outbreak, which is the second biggest in the history of Ebola. Mm -hmm. uh, more than 2,000 patients died from Ebola, confirmed. Um, but in Eastern Congo, we have the situation, it's not only a deadly disease, but it's also a deadly um, civil war. Mm -hmm. And these two deadly forces are, of course, contradicting each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, uh, hospitals are burned they're, down. They're, 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 uh, unfortunately, I think they are helping each other to create uh, more dead bodies, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's terrible because the people in Eastern Congo today, they say, well, some of organizations just come now to help us for Ebola, but nobody uh, takes care of the war yeah? and what we are suffering of is the war much more mm -hmm. than Ebola um, But everything we learned in West Africa in terms of isolating patients We have to think again in Eastern Congo today because people don't trust the health system mm -hmm. So they don't 
come to treat, be treated. Yeah? So we have to think again our concepts and how we can maybe treat people at home you know, when, mm -hmm. when they don't come to the hospital. Do they come uh, to have this uh, vaccination? Yes, uh, this is uh, working quite good. Yeah, of course, everyone today who works in Eastern Congo, every health worker gets vaccinated. And fortunately, we had no um, casualties of our stuff by Ebola. Um, that's good. Um, at the moment, also, we push for for real um, treatment options. Yeah, so, um, and if if the first indications we have uh, prove to be uh, sustainable, we may also have uh, in sooner than later also a drug which we can give, we can offer to mm -hmm. the patient so their survival becomes better because we have to realize uh, still Ebola untreated, we have a, a mortality rate of 60 to 90 percent, mm -hmm. which is terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, 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 and um, uh, just a little bit to change topic, uh, let me ask you about possible salary of doctor mm -hmm. and nurse uh, in MSF. For example, if Russian doctor uh, will want uh, to join mm -hmm. MSF and will go on mission on nurse, mm -hmm. uh, how much uh, they will receive uh, mm -hmm. in money? I, I am pretty sure um, that uh, it's, uh, this is a question which uh, will be interesting for mm -hmm. our auditory. Yeah, and, and uh, clearly today everyone who joins MSF will get a working contract, will get a salary, which we have to be, make which, sure... Uh, which is actually nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and when I started off with MSF, I didn't get a working contract. Yeah? This is still kind of a new thing. Um, but uh, uh, for us, this is important because we want to be a fair employee. Very clearly also because over 90% of all our income are private funds. We have to be very careful about how we spend mm -hmm. the money. Uh, so our salaries are quite moderate, yeah? so it is more than a thousand euro um, you get a month there, but this is of course a sacrifice mm -hmm. to what you usually earn as a doctor. Mm -hmm. So whenever I join MSF as a doctor in the field, I lose money. Mm -hmm. um, but um, also the, the organization takes care of your vaccination, they fly you into the project, they feed you there, they house you there, so you have no real expenses uh, during your mission. Um, so uh, you can make a career in MSF in terms of responsibility, in terms of a, a very meaningful job, um, but you will never get rich with MSF mm -hmm. because it's a privately funded organization and we don't want to make people rich because of this. People, I just want uh, to emphasize, you, you will never reach with uh, MSF, but, right. you, but you'll have a very challenging and very interesting <laughs> job. If you want to get rich, don't join MSF. <laughs> yeah. But if you want to have a really interesting uh, challenge as doctor or nurse or, or logistician, uh, it's a great way to uh, experience uh, this. Um, and it, it's also kind of a prevention uh, because it attracts the right people. Yeah? I think someone who, who would join the organization to become rich, um, maybe the motivation is not the one we need to look after. Yeah? So, um, but of course, uh, it is, uh, we, we have to be very careful with every money we spend. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we want to sort of buy drugs, we want to buy um, um, medical equipment mm -hmm. and all this. Yeah? Um, and we don't want to spend all the money in, in salaries. Uh, that's the reason behind. Just general question. Uh, um, uh, did you make a lot of uh, friends uh, during your mission? Um, uh, what is uh, just, you know, the human communication? The, what is, uh, is it a nice um, environment from, uh, you know, the, the human uh, part? Uh, oh. And that's a good point, yeah. a beautiful point, because Always you work in a very international mixed team and you, might, you, you, you find, you meet very interesting people so I, and from all over the world. Yeah? And because we all focused on the same thing, um, it works very well. Yeah? I also, I, I, I worked with Russians and it was mm -hmm. really good fun to, to learn uh, what they bring into the mission and I speak a few words of Russian yeah, and I know. so we, we could exchange that as well. Um, and for me, of course, beside the medical and the humanitarian challenge, uh, it's a great pleasure each time to find, and sometimes you find them again in the next mission yeah, because you have worked with them before. Uh, so the team spirit and, and, and talking at night and sharing your experience, that's a great pleasure. And uh, that's maybe part of the motivation, mm -hmm. apart from all the other things, uh, because the teamwork is, is, is really great. Great. Actually, but, um, I, but for the moment, I'm going to say um, uh, several words about MSF uh, by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I uh, really think that uh, organizational and logistical things in MSF, it's uh, amazing because uh, they need uh, just to coordinate. If you, I, 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 it's not about medical stuff of MSF. So I, I am not asking you, I mm. just understand that people who organize the mission, people who uh, just making logistics, people who um, uh, making possible to b bring a, a medical equipment, uh, they are uh, very organized, very smart, uh, very cre creative, uh, and I am pretty sure that it's, it's a very important uh, part of the meeting. Yeah, uh, well, that's a good point. Mission. You you mentioned logistics, um, and and for me, in each each project, it's really impressive to see the logistics uh, we have and uh, we, everything we need in in whatever program it is. It's pre-packed, yeah? so if it is malaria or malnourished children or a surgical project or what, however, um, we do a, a short evaluation ourselves yeah, because of our independence. Yeah. We go there with a small team, and I've done this several times. Uh, we look at the situation, what we need, and then we tell those numbers, yeah, how many people are there, what kind of diseases do we see, back to our logistics center. And within a few hours, they can pack those ready-made kits onto an airplane fly there and within a few hours we can start working with material we know it's it's high mm -hmm. quality uh, we have known it, we have worked with that before uh, so it's quite convenient if you do more than one project with msf that you always rely on the same quality material which uh, is is brought there in 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 very short uh, time yeah? so for me this is each time i'm i'm really so yes, the management actually amazing. B b b b b every medical person could uh, understand it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, just um, uh, maybe you could uh, share some interesting, uh, uh, f may maybe funny, maybe interesting, uh, any case which is uh, just, uh, you know, b b occurred uh, on the mission mm -hmm. or maybe uh, b it's necessary for education. Mm -hmm. uh, just some case, because after that, I'm going to ask uh, uh, you what you did in Moscow. I know that you made the lectures for Russian students, mm -hmm. etc. Um, I think one of the most challenging situations I came across lately was a situation in Yemen. Uh, actually, it was on my first day, and um, it, was a f it was a calm day. But then in the evening, when I thought the day is all over, I got a call from the emergency room from, from a young colleague mm -hmm. who called me and said, Tancred, can you come over and help me? So I came there and we had a young man who got a shotgun wound in the, mm -hmm. in the chest. Um, so we had to set, put, insert a tube in the lung mm -hmm. to sort of uh, inflate the lung again. And we were just done with him, saved his life. We were very happy. And then the next patient with a, with a shot injury, shotgun injury came in. And every couple of minutes, a new patient came in with a gunshot wound. Um, up to a point that our small emergency room was packed with heavily injured people. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, up to the point that all the doctors we had in the hospital, all the nurses, we called in to help. And we were at the very stretched capacity of what mm -hmm. we could do. And it was clear we cannot move any. We thought there's somewhere a mass shooting in town and all the victims come here. And now we knew there's nothing more. We, mm -hmm. we can't lose any doctor or nurse. Mm -hmm. But we also can't accept another patient because we are full. The, the emergency mm -hmm. was full. Was and while I was resuscitating, yeah, doing active life mm -hmm. support, <clears throat> something happened, which is one of the most terrible things we can think of. It's, not, it's bombing of hospitals, but also shooting in the hospital. And I, we heard a shooting next door in the hospital. And now we were re really shocked yeah, because we thought, okay, mm -hmm. now the shooting comes into our emergency room. And being the most senior doctor in the room, I had to make the decision, what do we do? Do we keep resuscitating the patient or do we run and hide? Mm -hmm. And this was one of the most difficult decisions I ever had to make because it was clear when we stop resuscitating, this patient will not survive. So this was difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, tell me uh, what kind of decision you made and why? Um, yeah, the, the decision I took, and it was about, it was not even seconds, eh? mm -hmm. it was uh, sort of um, uh, parts of seconds I had to make that decision because the, the threat was, was just there. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course I had to make a decision to let go of all the patients and, and find mm -hmm. safety and security for the stuff. So I said, everyone stops, let's hide and run, run and hide. Uh, we did that, we went to the door, uh, uh, safe room next door, slammed the door, 
and waited until uh, the security uh, people came in mm -hmm. and told us, well, it's safe now. All clear. They it's all clear. Them. And uh, of course, it was a big shock. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and it took us a while to find out what really happened. Um, mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, only one one person got killed in the hospital, and the the perpetrator, um, the killer, um, uh, because we we had very many security uh, measures mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. place, yeah? mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it was clear this hospital is without arms, and we had several um, stages of checking. Yeah? Mm -hmm. There was a metal detector; people were checked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this man who, who did the shooting came into the hospital without arms and then uh, a colleague of him threw a gun over the hospital fence and uh, a wall yeah, and when he was inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he was smart enough to sort of counter all our security measures. Um, and Which was, uh, to be honest, simple. Which was simple and easy for him to do, but yeah. uh, of course, uh, yeah, there yeah, are yeah. always ways to to surround safety yeah. and security. The good thing, the good realization for us was, it was not an attack on the hospital. It was not an attack against Doctors Without Borders. It was more of a private revenge. Um, but of course, it took us a while to also uh, rethink our security standards uh, to, of course, help all our employees who were. Uh, quite shocked by that incident. Um, but uh, that gun shooting um, um, people. So he he, he actually. Uh, so the man was uh, who shot at uh, all of them. Just one man. Or oh, it was uh, <laughs> also another accident. Right. It it turned out. I mean, it took us about twenty four hours after that to uh, to clarify the whole story. What happened. So it was not a mass shooting in town, what we thought, yeah, mm -hmm. on the receiving end of the patients. It was, in the end, it were three conflict parties in town who, of course, yeah, they didn't negotiate mm -hmm. who, who does, does mm -hmm. the shooting first. Yeah, so they all happened at the same time. So the casualties of those shooting came to the hospital at the same time. And one of the uh, sort of conflict parties continued to come into mm -hmm. the hospital. Mm -hmm. That was the, mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also wanted uh, to ask you about um, uh, the, your current visit uh, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. I know that you made uh, several lectures uh, for students from uh, Sechen of uh, Medical University of, or Institute, mm -hmm. which is uh, quite a famous uh, mm -hmm. medical facility, medical facility and medical educational mm -hmm. facility here in Russia. Could you tell me about the topics of these uh, lectures mm -hmm. and uh, uh, do you think they are important for students mm -hmm. or not? I know that students wasn't uh, only Russian, it mm -hmm. were uh, an international team uh, who are also studied in the session of the uh, yeah. Institute. No, it was a great pleasure and honor to me for me to be here, to be invited um, um, by Dr. Nikita mm -hmm. um, of uh, Shechenov uh, University. And we were, over two days, we did uh, uh, emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. um, we invited about 200 students, uh, as you said, yeah, from all over the world who are, who are studying at Shechenov. Um, and that was great, uh, a great experience for me. And, and, and the feedback was very mm -hmm. positive from the students. So we started off, what are the main priorities top priorities in an emergency intervention when MSF um, intervenes after a natural disaster or in a man-made disaster. That was the first. Then the second one was about triage. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if there's a mass casualty happening, what are the first steps we do um, as doctors and nurses to help those people and to sort out who benefits most from uh, the medical care we can offer. And then the third one um, yesterday was about a hospital setup. Yeah? So how can we when there is mass casualties, trauma cases, uh, how can we from sort of day one until uh, the first month uh, help uh, to uh, offer them surgical care? And um, yeah, so and then we had also some practical training organized by the university. And I think the, the, the students gained a lot of practical insight of what it means uh, in a resource poor setting mm -hmm. uh, to do the most effective quality medical care we can offer. Um, for me, it was interesting also because they had a lot of questions. Um, so we had great, a great debate uh, at, at the university. Maybe you could um, um, uh, tell us uh, several words about this uh, practical session. Mm -hmm. What actually did you study or debate it and um, uh, which particular practical measures? And by the way, how many uh, students uh, you had for practical session? Because mm -hmm. uh, practical session with 200 students, it's uh, really, really difficult. Yeah, yeah. for the practical sessions, uh, there were a little fewer. 
Um, and so we had um, <clears throat> these three lectures and then we had the practical training. The practical training basically was about putting uh, IV lines in, putting uh, bone um, uh, Infusion, needles in, yeah. infusions, uh, sort of how to put the tourniquet in yeah, to stop mm -hmm. bleedings, acute bleedings, um, how to insert um, uh, a cannula when they don't have any ways of breathing. Cricoterot, uh, uh, I mean. You right, mean, you mean. Yeah. So, and those, those By the way, how, how did you do it? What is your approach? Scalpel, uh, bush and uh, tube? Or? Yeah. The good thing is um, um, Dr. Nikita had all the different techniques available, also including sort of different generations of techniques. Yeah? So the students could learn how from very early stages, yeah, when the, the care material was quite basic, up to the latest quite advanced techniques. Yeah? So we had it all. Yeah? Uh, and so the, the patients could also see uh, the development of medical um, technique over time. Um, and, and that was really interesting also for me to see that they could handle quite well. Um, and I think it, it was a good combination that for um, after the, the lecture and discussions we had, uh, of course they were very engaged to do the practical um, um, tests. Um, and for, for the hospital setup there, yeah, we said, uh, what, what is it, what, what needs to be done? Very Maybe you can uh, just show me some pictures from yeah. the hospital and comment uh, them a little bit. Okay. Uh, but if I see uh, this right, it's uh, just some kind of CPR for trauma patient. Right. Uh, yeah, it shows, of course, a situation like this. This is never relaxed. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. always. It's a, it's about time. It's about doing the mm -hmm. right thing, being prepared. Yeah, of course, to do this, you need to be uh, um, trained before. Yeah, so this is a quick uh, sort of a picture of this. Um, then, of course, it's again the um, what, what's humanitarian action mm -hmm. as we understand it. Yeah, so it's unconditional assi mm -hmm. assistance to everyone who comes, yeah, mm -hmm. regardless of mm -hmm. religion and politics. Uh, the principles we follow, yeah, the humanity mm -hmm. neutrality. It's, uh, uh, actually, I will read it. Uh, ask not who is right in this war, but who needs aid because of this war. Right. It's ju it's, just wanted it's, to. And that's important for yeah. for me as doctor. Also, the other one, yeah. I know as a doctor I'm not a solution to the conflict, which mm -hmm. is political most of the time, yeah, but my aid or what we can do, the medical action, is essential in the absence of a political solution. And that helps me to focus on the people and let the politics mm -hmm. go because mm -hmm. I can't change them yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's for me very helpful uh, each time I come mm -hmm. into a conflict which is man-made or political uh, to focus on the medical act, which, which of course we can do. Yeah. So then we looked at uh, what's the, the curve yeah, if there's mm -hmm. a disaster and of course uh, in, if, if there are a lot of trauma patients, the influx of, of trauma patients mm -hmm. is the highest in the beginning yeah, that's what this black big curve shows yeah, and then that slowly mm -hmm. goes down. Uh, a little later comes in the, the other emergencies, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. non-surgical emergencies, um, just to make students understand that we have to act quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. If we are not there on the spot right away, we are too late. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really about timing. Um, and then um, we looked at different different scenarios what mm -hmm. MSF can offer. So in this first 42 hours yeah, uh, to save lives. Yeah. And of course, rapid access is important and, and rapid intervention is important. And then we developed over the years, actually after the, the, the earthquake in Haiti in mm -hmm. 2010, there was a huge dilemma felt in the organization that we feel, okay, um, we need to be quicker because what happened in Port-au-Prince mm -hmm. in 2010 was that the, the earthquake happened in the capital. Mm -hmm. So all medical infrastructure, all hospitals, which were there where we usually can bring the patients, were destroyed. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we had, and that's the, the next picture, mm -hmm. we had to improvise. Yeah? So on the big mm -hmm. picture you see yeah. here, yeah. Uh, surgeons are working sort of next to the rubble, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, under a tent, under, under just a, a, an umbrella sometimes. So improvising what's there, yeah? because uh, it, this is sort of minutes, hours after after the uh, the earthquake uh, and we had to find sudden solutions we couldn't wait until uh, sort of mm -hmm. more material yeah. comes in by the way do you know my, about first mission of msf here in uh, uh, soviet union 
what was it? Um, well, I know that MSF did do some care in, even here in Moscow for homeless uh, people and for street it's, children. It's very interesting. Um, yeah. Actually, I will tell you in mm -hmm. uh, uh, conclusion of our um, um, uh, conversation. Actually, it was a huge uh, earthquake in mm -hmm. Armenia, in mm -hmm. former Soviet Union, in Spitak. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 1988, mm -hmm. and it was a first time when the international organization and uh, the uh, MSF mm -hmm came uh, just to help Russian people as well uh, as uh, Russian medics uh, all over uh, Russia, from Moscow, from uh, any mm -hmm. other countries. And uh, um, if I understood right, it was a huge number of injuries, mm -hmm. uh, around 100,000, 200,000, mm -hmm. something like this, and uh, a huge number of ex uh, experience. So we know about yeah. Medicine Sun Frontiers from this time. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting because back then I was still at school, yeah. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> this was yeah, long before. Yeah, 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 but it, yeah, uh, yeah, it actually yeah, was yeah. A, a huge occasion. It was a um, uh, former last uh, year of, uh, probably last year of Soviet Union mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it, it was like Chernobyl uh, yeah. for, for, for Soviet people at that uh, point. Mm -hmm. So, and MSF uh, was there. Yeah, so. yeah. and it, this is, that shows again yeah, how important it is to have a quick reaction. Yeah? So this is why we believe we are always have sort of material, but also doctors, nurses on standby yeah, who can leave within minutes after an incident like this happens, an earthquake, a hurricane, uh, a tsunami, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're ready to leave any minute, yeah, uh, which of course we believe is important after, after a mass incident of injured people. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Tancred, thank you very much for this conversation. I will just repeat. Uh, we could have uh, probably 10 shows with you about particular mm. uh, particular things and uh, I think we'll have it. Are you going to Moscow next time to have a lecture for students? We we are about to plan this. Uh, this time I uh, went for a multiple entry visa mm -hmm. so I can come back anytime. It was a great pleasure. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Спасибо большое. Thank you.